You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Dia Khan, producer and filmmaker about honor killings. We'll also be talking about the migrant crisis, the wonderful welcome committees that have been established in various countries, as well as a fatwa on roller skating in Mecca. Stay with us. The UN conservatively estimates that 5,000 women and girls are killed each year by members of their own family, often fathers, brothers, uncles and cousins, and sometimes mothers and other family relatives. Honor killings are usually premeditated and intended to restore a family's honor by cleansing the so-called shame which a woman or girl is said to have brought. Clearly, there is no honor in killing. Clearly, when we are talking about honor killing, while the woman and girl who's been killed is often seen to be shameful, really, in reality, in any sort of, you know, um, human way of thinking and values, it's actually the killers who should, who are shameful, who should be ashamed, and who should be prosecuted. And I think that we've always had this uh, in Middle East, and I think in, in Middle East and North Africa is uh, recognized as a major issue and people are fighting it. And I think what's happened, we've had that in Europe, suddenly for a period it was treated as non-existent. Yeah, and even so, you had for a very long time courts in Europe giving uh, men, primarily men in families, reduced sentences, but also still in the Middle East, in South Asia, men who do commit honor crimes are often given reduced sentences and um, given uh, let go very lightly, basically. Uh, th that's true, but I think society broadly, not states, society, not institutions, society, I think general public, recognize this as a major issue and there are a lot of campaigns to actually expose honor killing and, um, and get rid of it as, as um, a, re a, a social malaise. And that's something we need to uh, highlight. What's happening in Europe and North Africa and Middle East they are linked together. So we need to have uh, an international sort of a campaign against this uh, um, horrific murder of young girls and women. Yeah, and one of the things is that there are many brilliant campaigns and a lot of wonderful work taking place. One of them is by Dia Khan, who did a wonderful film, and it's an award-winning film, on the honor killing of Banaz Mahmoud, a woman in Britain. We're going to show you a minute clip of this fantastic film, and after that, you can hear an interview we did with Dia Khan earlier. Don't go away, it is not to be missed. She was a very calm and quiet person. She loved to see people happy. She did not like arguments. She didn't want people raising their voice. She hated it. She just wanted a happy life. She wanted, you know, a family. And I'm wondering if you want to speak. Who killed Banaz? You're innocent, then who killed Banaz? You're a you're who killed Banaz? People following me, or still now they follow me. At any time, if anything happens to me, it's them. They killed her there just just for for being in love. I mean, sometimes I am thinking why love should be so hated. If she was in my life, my life would be orange and yellow. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you on our program. I wanted to ask you about Banal's A Love Story. It's a film that really had a huge effect on me and I think a lot of people. How did you feel making it? 
it was the, the story had a huge impact on me as well. Um, when I first started out making, uh, when I first started out, I wanted to make a documentary about honor killings, and the reason I wanted to make the, the, a documentary about that is I wanted people to understand what it really is, what all the dynamics are, um, in order for people to then react to it appropriately. So, people, whether it's the police, whether it's the education system, whether it's the health services, anyone on the front lines in a position to help young people at risk, for them to understand better what it is. So I wanted to create this sort of help tool, educational tool for them. And when I first started out, I was uh, actually going to cover several stories. And one of the stories was Bonazza's story. And I remember the more I started reading about her, the more I started looking into her case, I just realized that this was the story that I wanted to tell throughout the film. And the reason for that, because actually a lot of my friends and a lot of people have asked me, you know, is it because her story is more brutal than any of the others? Is it because it's more violent, more vicious? And the answer is no, they're all really brutal. They're all really violent and vicious and up close and personal. The reason I chose Banaz is in her story, you, it, it contains all the lessons that we need to learn. But it also, and, and highlights all the problems and all the failures in the system uh, which contributed to her death. But also it, it contains a part of the solution. And the part of the solution is this woman, Caroline Good, who investigated her case. As much as Banaz was let down in her life by the police, after her death, she was found by this, this woman. And the reason I'm calling her a part of the solution is this woman, this police officer, cared about this girl beyond in her capacity as a police officer. She said that one of the first times that I met Caroline, uh, I was doing research interviews, and we finished, she sort of gave me this very, um, very sort of formal police interview and you know, explaining you know, the investigation was like this and then we did this and we did that. And then when we finished, uh, I said to her, I said, yeah, but why did you care so much? You didn't really have to go to Iraq and secure the first ever extradition. You didn't have to go to the, to the lengths that you went to. You could have just taken your pat on the back and case closed and you're done. Mm -hmm. And she murmured, she said, well, you know, it's because I love her. And I just went, what do you mean you love her? She said, well, you know, I just feel like, you know, she should be loved and, and someone should love her and her family should have and they didn't. And so I should, so I do. And I, I just choked up and I, I just realized this is the story I want to tell. I mean, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. This is the story I want to tell. I want to tell not just the horror story, but I also want to tell the love story, not the obvious one of the, the man that Banas fell in love with, but, the, but this one of this white woman, who police officer who's never met this kid in her life who can so desperately, deeply care and love about this, love this young girl, that's what we need. To me, that's the solution to everything that we're, we're, you know, we all care about, is for people to care. Because once you care, you take action. Once you care, you can change the world. Once you care, you can take on such horrifically difficult um, uh, issues like this. And, because I wanted, I wanted there to be a window of possibility. I didn't want people to watch the film or to hear about these types of cases and think, well, there's nothing we can do. Or sit in some kind of self-righteous, kind of moral, morally indignant sort of position of, well, this is just what those people do, just let them get on with it, let them kill each other. But for people to really sit down and feel, actually, no, these young women, these young people are ours, all of ours, whether we're white, whether we're brown, whether we're whatever we are, there are kids and we all have a responsibility to care for them and to be there for them and to do our part. And this woman, Caroline, sort of exemplifies that. And so that's, to me, it's so important to not just, in, my, in the work that I'm doing anyway, is to show the problems, is to ask the difficult questions, but then also allow for the space where possibility of solutions can, can, can happen. Tell us a bit about Banaz exactly, because also one, I think, strength of her story is also her resistance to this all, her trying to get help throughout. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing about Banaz is that, well, just a very brief background on her life. She was born uh, in Iraq, uh, in the Kurdish region, uh, region of Iraq. Um, her, uh, her and all of her sisters were cut uh, by their grandmother as children, uh, as a female genital mutilation, as children. 
At the age of about 10, her and her family uh, moved to Britain and settled in South London. Came from a very traditional, a fairly strict family. And um, at the around age of about 17, um, the family found a husband for her. And this husband was 10 years older than her, was brought straight from, from back home. Um, so in terms of compatibility, very, very little. Um, she agreed to the marriage. As, as much as a 17-year-old can agree to a marriage to a stranger. Um, this man was very violent, he was very brutal. He beat her, he raped her, raped her uh, which she tried to keep a secret from the family for quite a long time. Then eventually, when she couldn't take it anymore, she, she told her family and said that she wanted to leave. And her family's response was, you need to try harder to be a better wife to this man and you need to go back, in fact, and, and, and do your job as a wife. And she did. She did go back and she continued to try and eventually she couldn't take it anymore. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Um, she left, went back to the family home, lived with the parents and started the process of rebuilding her life. And in, in, in this process of, of rebuilding her life, she also fell in love with somebody. Um, this, the, the extended family found out about and very quickly started making plans to, to stop this. Um, and what we know now is that there was a meeting that took place in, uh, in their grandmother's house in South London in December. Um, and by the end of January, she was killed. Um, now, the, the sort of added tragedy for me in this is that while she was alive, Banaz went to the police five times asking for help, five different times saying, this is what's going to happen to me. I need help, what can I do? And the fact that she was turned back every single time, other than I think the very last time, um, the woman said, it sounds to me like you're in a, the police officer said, it sounds to me like you're in a very serious situation, you need to come back. Uh, you need to stay here and not go back to the family. She said, I'll be back tomorrow because my mom's at home and my mom's not gonna let anything happen to me. And she never came back because they killed her that night. Um, so to me, you know, not only was Banaz betrayed by her family and, and then by the silence of the wider community who knew about what had happened to her and never said anything, but also the fact that the society that she lived in, the society that promises us equal rights, equal opportunities, but also equal protection, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you look like and what background or family you come from, you, are, you deserve justice, you deserve protection. The fact that none of that was available to her in Britain today is unacceptable. Uh, and, and that betrayal, is, it's, just, it's just devastating. And so that's the part of the, the story that's very important to me in the sense of those are the lessons that we need to learn and the lessons are that when a woman comes and asks her, the thing is Banaz did everything right you know very often uh, authorities say that when it comes to either domestic violence cases or forced marriage cases or any kind of violent uh, or, or abusive uh, cases when it comes to women most women don't want to come forward and ask for help or most people most women don't come and report it she did she did everything we're told we should do if we're in trouble, and still there's no help. I mean, on one occasion, one of the police officers said that she was just being hysterical and just being overdramatic, and actually went to her father, went to Banaz's father, and said, she's trying to raise a complaint against you. And I, I believe that surely that must have accelerated the, the process and the plans that the family were already considering. And it's, you know, to me, our young people are on one hand restricted and suffocating within their own communities or their families and on the other hand they are not heard, they're not seen and they're not included and treated as if they are a part of British society fully either. And so I think many of our young people find themselves caught in this very, in, in the sort of no man's land and, and it also makes it I think very difficult for some young people and young women especially to leave abusive relationships because this is, they are afraid of stories like Panas as well because they worry that if I go out will somebody believe me, will somebody even understand that this does happen and this is real for me. I guess one final, final question will have to be, how can we change this, you know, from Iran to Iraq to Britain and elsewhere? You know, all change comes from ourselves. So I think each 
each and every one of us as individuals, I think there's a lot we can do. And some of the things that we can do is, you know, issues like honor killings. It's not happening for the health of the family. The family is doing it because they are wanting to save face, not for themselves, but for us. There's a reason why these killings happen, because they're trying to impress or trying to give us, the broader community, a message. So I think all of us have to make it, uh, we have to make it very clear what we really think about it. Um, and we have to make a decision. What do we really want for our young people? What do we want for our future? Do we want for our future to suffocate all talent, all dreams, all choices, all true expression of our young people and our children? Is that the kind of stinted development and, and therefore stinted societies that we want? Or do we want to encourage and build and support healthy, flourishing, happy, loving, caring, safe, sane children? And I think, you know, as families, rather than, rather than gaining honor from murdering your child, surely your honor should become greater and respected for being a good father, for being a good mother and a good brother, rather than the brother and the father who murders the woman in their family. That's not honorable, that's not manly, that's nothing. That's nothing. We are exterminating. We are cutting the legs off our own people, our own futures, by doing this. Banaz should have still been here. The world, Britain, need, and, and the, the Kurdish community, Muslim community, whichever community, they need people like Banaz in them. We need our children to be alive. We don't need our children to go to jihad and die. We don't need our children to be murdered by their own parents and their own families. We don't need our women to be murdered by, or beaten and abused and violated by their husbands. We need, this is why our societies are not working, is because we are destroying the very essence of what our future is, which is our young people. It's our women, it's our daughters and sons. And we need them alive. We don't need them to die in the name of religion or in the name of culture or in the name of honor. We need them here with us. So that's what we can do, is as neighbors, as community members, as uncles, as aunts, as sisters, as mothers and brothers, we can all take a stand. And we can all say that no, this is not the future that we want. We want a future that includes all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shocking news of the week is the continued migrant crisis in Europe and across the world. Of course, what has been most shocking and in a way representative of this massive human tragedy is the photo of a little boy, a little child whose body is found drowned on a beach in Turkey. His name is Alan Kordani and it has, you know, just... Um, outraged the world and saddened the world really. Absolutely and I think galvanized the whole human sort of reaction to this. Um, when you see that picture um, washed to the shore of uh, Turkey, the tried uh, the family, um, um, father and mother tried to have a better life. They had been running away from Syria and the war in Syria and when you actually see an innocent child you know it's washed and face down on, on a beach it's just it, it, it brings all the pain that our thousands and thousands and millions of people uh, are uh, feeling and the suffering they go through. And it, that sort of showed that picture to the world for everybody to see. And people have reacted to that. I you think know, it's also important because it, sort, it humanizes the issue, you know. Um, the, the problem is that sometimes people only see numbers, large numbers. And actually, you know, when you see one family, the mother's died, two children have died, Alan lost his brother as well. The father who came with all these hopes and dreams is devastated, you know. There's, there's no way one can describe how he must be feeling. And in a sense, it just shows the reality for so many people, you know, people on trains, people behind borders, people being pushed back by police but also being a welcome by many people. Yeah, we'll come to that in, in, in a minute, but I think that capturing of that moment, humanizing 
in a very tragic uh, um, uh, moment, humanizing the reality of uh, um, refugee. And these are the people who are actually running away from war, from destitution, from poverty, from oppression, from reaction, from religious uh, dictatorship. And people need to see this differently. And I think that's, uh, we've seen this in, in, in this week, that is shifted and people have come forward the real humanity is, is trying to show itself. Yeah, when I looked at this picture it did remind me a lot about my own life because my parents left Iran, they fled Iran so that I could have a better life, my sister could have a better life and to think that that is exactly what uh, Alan's uh, you know, father and mother had this dream and for it to end in this really tragic way um, it's, it is shocking and I think this picture is going to be an iconic photo of the reality of flights and um, you know uh, but also this dream uh, that ca is broken for so many people now in a village in india uh, there are there are these sort of elder tribunals they're unelected they just do their own thing and they have basically um, decided that two sisters must be uh, paraded nude in the town and raped because they come from what is called a lower caste, a Dalit caste, because why? Their brother married someone from a higher caste and since he's dishonored that family by, by having their daughter marry a lower caste man, their family needs to be dishonored by raping their daughters. The world is going crazy. I mean this is uh, you know, no matter how you try to explain this, is not comprehensible. You know, we can't comprehend this, uh, these calculations, these stupid, uh, violent sort of arrangements, caste system, and people being predated and raped in public. I mean, this is not in even in Middle Ages. I wouldn't think these sort of atrocities were committed. But also, what's interesting, even when the man has dishonored, done something dishonorable. It's the sisters that have to yeah. be raped. And again, it goes back to the topic of our program, which is honor killings and how so much of it is woven with women and control of women and how women are seen to be properties that can be just raped and sold and bartered as deemed necessary. That needs, uh, you know, we, we need in the same way that the world now has the ability to uh, come out and protest um, and put an end uh, internationally. I mean, we, we've always said there are so certain things that need to um, be uh, responded to internationally. We have seen that it's possible and the world needs to be outraged. And, yeah, and, and, and the good thing is there has been quite a lot of outrage over this. Uh, in fact, the, the family went to the police and they weren't given any help and now they are in hiding. Um, and uh, so, uh, but the good thing is that now the sisters have petitioned the country's Supreme Court, India's Supreme Court. So, you know, that's good news to some extent, uh, but more pressure needs to be put on to make sure that this doesn't happen and these sorts of things don't happen again. Now, the insane fatwa of this week, um, where do we begin? There is a man uh, who has been videotaped roller skating around the Kaabe. You know, you've got to do it seven times. Um, and uh, basically, there, there are people who are demanding a fatwa because, you know, if someone's roller skating around, they should be walking and easy. focusing on God and not bothering with roller skates. Man, I think the whole, uh, you know, image of somebody roller skating with his robe it's and half funny. naked uh, <laughs> round cab. I mean, that's, that, that's funny in itself. But the fact that, you know, there are people who want even to restrict that. So you've got to suffer because the whole thing, walk. the whole thing is about suffering. You've got to go, I think, miles and miles. You've got to go on the stone, Satan, and that sort of thing. The crazy <laughs> arrangements and, uh, that they have over there. But he's just demanding a, a fatwa against roller skating and uh, rollerblading. I, I don't know where we're going. Well, I mean, it's it is it's interesting because, the, you know, some of the complaints is that you know if people see him doing this, then God knows what's going to happen around the Kaaba. They've got to take control right away and issue a ban on these sorts of things. And they're going on about he should use a wheelchair if he needs help walking. Well, obviously he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just prefers roller skating. We'll and have, we'll have kites very soon. People <laughs> kiting around. <laughs>
<laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we should say, I think what we should say is that you know, <laughs> the whole the whole arrangement it's is messed up. Yeah. What is this going round a piece of stone and saying this is God's house? Yeah. And you have the kings, I mean, of Saudi, do it, kings of Saudi Arabia raking the money. I mean, no, and if just... you're going to do it, you might as well do it on roller skates. That's what we say. Now, the good news is, of course, these wonderful welcome committees for migrants, for refugees, asylum seekers. And what's wonderful is that, you know, you've got this out you know, this um, outpouring of human support and solidarity to the extent where I think in one place they were saying, we don't want any more donations, we can't handle any more, we've got more than enough, you know, and people just volunteering their homes, going and helping, handing out um, water and food to asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, it's wonderful. The levy is broken. I mean, the reality is, you know, a few weeks ago we had a situation that we don't want immigrants and refugees here and you had, you had Calais, as these were criminals, you know, the whole picture that, you know, papers, writing papers like the Daily Mail in Britain and Express were portraying was uh, uh, criminals trying to come to the shores of decent sort of Europe. Now we've seen uh, what's happened and people have come out. Every city now, they've set up uh, groups in solidarity in support of Calais migrants. I mean, you, you know, two, four weeks ago I would have wouldn't have sort of dreamed of having this amount of support and solidarity. And we've always it's, been in, I know I'm talking too much, yeah, but you are we've as always usual, been yeah. <laughs> in support of um, refugees, and we said we these are the best of the, the best. countries. Yeah, yes. definitely. And there are so many uh, ways to continue to support um, migrants coming in. We need to do that. And the reality is that it's a moral duty to do it. It's a moral duty for borders to be open, for people who are fleeing, to be able to get some sort of safety. Uh, people like um, Alan's family, they didn't get a chance, but there are others who should. This wonderful photo for this week's Slice of Life is of a refugee in Beirut who is carrying his daughter, selling pens, and this image was seen by an Icelander who then set up a crowdfunding um, Indiegogo campaign for this man. Uh, his name is Abdul Halim Atar, and she or he has raised $181,000. And they found this refugee. He's a Palestinian refugee who was in Syria and had to flee Syria as a result of what's going on there. And he was so... Uh, you know, uh, happy, over, 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 yeah. overwhelmed by this, that he said that he wants to set up an education fund for Syrian children. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it, it this is. individual act of uh, human solidarity shows, you know, he's not just this person, but everybody who's contributed to that, uh, the fund. And it shows how much the world could very easily be changed. It doesn't need sophisticated sort of governments. It doesn't need huge institutions. We just need to allow human solidarity to take its course and we'll see that it's possible. I mean, it's the same way that a family from Sweden went to, uh, um, to Greece, went about on holiday. They started supporting refugees and they gave them food, water. Um, and, uh, you know, and these are sort of great acts that is part and parcel of, you know, human solidarity. And, and we need to insist on human solidarity. It's part and parcel more of... More than uh, ever we need this. It's part and parcel of being fully human, really. And, I think in situations like this, when there are, uh, you know, very um, tragic events that unfold before our eyes, we do see people's humanity coming through, and it's really wonderful to see that. We're reaching the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. We want to remind you that we've got a telephone uh, number that you can call and leave a message, and we will try and play some of your messages on our program as well. Yes, absolutely. And that brings us to the end of our program, as you said. Until next week. Have a good week. Bye. From, from Mariam and me.
Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.